Thank you to everyone that's joined us for October's webinar with Dr. Steph Lee. Please note here that our next webinar will be Tuesday, November 9th, and that will be with Whisper Valley. I'm going to introduce our speaker and then let her take it from here. Dr. Steph Lee is a pediatrician at Penn State St. Joseph in downtown Reading, who specializes in preventative medicine and public health. She is a climate change advocate for the American Academy of Pediatrics, Pennsylvania chapter, and a member of the Advisory Council for the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. Her work focuses on advocating for public policies that improve children's health, especially climate action, environmental justice, and immigrant health. You can find her on social media at Steph Lee MD. And Steph, I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you, Tanya, for the introduction. Um, as you notice, uh, I'm a pediatrician and preventive medicine specialist, and we're going to talk about clean air and asthma today. So um, climate's effects on children's health. The brief outline about um, what we're going to talk about today, um, just going a little bit of an overview of some air pollution exposure sources. You know, I never like to assume that anybody in my audience knows anything, so I like to just kind of have it out there, you know, some basic introduction on air pollution, and then also um, the health impacts um, across the ages. Since I'm a pediatrician, uh, I am a little bit more biased. I'm starting with uh, birth outcomes and then also um, children uh, and then um, talking about asthma as well, obviously, since that's the main topic. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we can do in terms of um, on the, in, for an individual, uh, on the individual level and also on the um, organization and policy level on how to uh, impact um, and improve air pollution issues and, and you know, the children's health as well. Okay, um, a little bit of background, as well I mentioned, I'm a pediatrician. Um, I had trained in California and then also did a preventive medicine over in South Carolina um, for a few years and then moved up here for practice. <laughs> so it's only been in all across the country um, and I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, how well, I think when it comes to climate action, it is really important to kind of think about how it affects, you know, where you are regionally, but also nationally, because it's such a, a national issue. All right. So talking about air pollution um, sources here, I kind of wanted to break it down into indoor and outdoor uh, sources. Um, so when it comes to indoor, you know, obviously there there's, can be multiple different um, air pollution sources, and a few of them are listed here. Um, we I want talk to want to talk about wood and gas burning stoves here, because especially because um, that can be seen as a more um, I guess you know, forgotten kind of uh, source, especially because um, there is, uh, if there's poor ventilation, then that can definitely um, accumulate as well. Um, and burning natural gas can create, you know, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, carbon monoxide as well, and those all contribute to air pollution. Um, breathing high, uh, breathing air with high concentration of nitric oxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, um, can irritate airways in the respiratory system and can, especially with asthma, lead to increased respiratory symptoms, hospital admissions and visits to um, emergency rooms. And longer exposure, of course, can, if you've never had asthma, uh, contribute to the development of asthma as well. And this can be, um, you know, people who are at greater risk are children and elderly as well, um, particularly vulnerable to the health effects of nitric oxide. Uh, tobacco use um, is definitely an indoor air pollution as well. Sometimes that I think also can be forgotten uh, sometimes. Um, and secondhand smoke exposure, obviously, for children's health um, can be very, uh, uh, can be an important source. Um, asbestos and mold as well. Mostly, um, I think we'll focus a little bit more on the outdoor uh, air pollution sources. So those can be, you know, on and off-road vehicles and um, traffic-related air pollution. So combustion, um, primarily. Uh, not sure if you, um, most of you may be aware that you know the EPA sets air quality standards for six criteria air pollutants. So um, carbon monoxide, lead, nitric oxide, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and ozone. Um, and so when it comes to combustion, 
Um, it contributes many primary pollutants, so carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, and um, volatile uh, organic compounds. And the, the combustion processes, not only do, do they produce primary um, sources, uh, primary pollutants, but they can also um, lead to secondary uh, based on combination with um, the atmosphere and precursor gases. Car emissions in particular um, are important sources for um, particulate matter um, and ultrafine particulate matter as well, especially with diesel vehicles. Um, but it also, for uh, traffic related air pollution, that also includes um, things like uh, road dust or fugitive dust, as you see in the middle, um, and you know, uh, tire wear, brake wear, that kind of thing. So those are some non-combustion sources. Industrial facilities are also a very um, large, important outdoor source of air pollution, especially here in Pennsylvania. Um, fracking has become an emerging source of concern, and you know that's the practice of fossil fuel extraction, right, from uh, hydraulic fracturing of deep underground um, uh, soil to release trapped gas. Um, and it's not only that, the whole, it's the whole process of wellheads, um, water storage pits and tanks, and the diesel powered equipment and trucks that can all contribute to the air pollution, um, particularly uh, nitric oxide and particulate matter. Another outdoor air solution, air pollution uh, source is industrial scale animal operations, so agricultural sources. Um, which I think a lot of people don't think about as well. Um, and that can come from, you know, just the, the animal um, decomposition of animal waste or the application of waste in the form of fertilizer. Um, and of course the, uh, you know, diesel powered engines or trucks and other um, equipment that have to be used as well. And then lastly, um, especially in the last year or so, the, you know, wildfires, right? It's very um, common outdoor air pollution and, you know, a lot of people may think of that as, you know, it's the West Coast kind of issue, but especially, you know, I think just in the last um, few months and when uh, wildfires up in Canada coming down to here, you're like you, we, because of, you know, wind and everything that can still be an issue here in Pennsylvania as well, like the after effects. All right. Um, so uh, this is a common pediatri uh, pediatrician phrase, you know, children are not little adults, that they might have similar um, uh, health issues that, you know, overlap with adult issues. But when it comes to children, um, their, their physiology can be very different, and especially when it comes to climate, because the, their effects um, are actually uh, it, they're more, children are more vulnerable to climate effects. And the reason for that is because they, uh, at baseline, even at, you know, if they're sitting down at, you know, at rest, they have an increased breathing rate. And so they can take in more air pollutants um, per, you know, pound of body weight than an adult can, even if they're in the same environment. So um, they're more vulnerable to that just based on, you know, how their body is. Um, and additionally, you know, if they're, you know, whether you're babies or infants or toddlers, if you have children, you know, at home, you can, you know, they can put anything in their mouths, that, especially at the younger ages, right, they may be exploring the environment, you know, that's their job to, you know, crawl around, touch things, put things in their mouths, explore, but they, because of that, they also are an increased um, risk of exposure because they're closer to the ground, you know, dust, that kind of thing can settle. Um, and they may have, for instance, if you had lead based paint, that kind of thing, you know, they can put those things in their mouths and they, just because of their placement in the environment, right? Um, closer to the ground, that kind of thing, they have an increased exposure. And so we, we really have to take that into account when you're thinking about climate's effects because they are uh, more vulnerable and uh, it's just based on, you know, physiology and, you know, how they're, how they're growing. And so what may affect adults, it's even more important to try and stop that, those effects in children. 
This is a figure, um, kind of an overview again of air pollution, the, the um, impacts that they can have on um, from birth to adults. As I mentioned, we'll kind of more focus just on the first two for birth and childhood outcomes. Um, this was actually taken from um, the uh, pediatrics journal, journal Pediatrics, um, and it was published by uh, the Council on Environmental Health within the American Academy of Pediatrics, who recently actually um, published in, I think June it was, uh, ambient air pollution and its effects on children. So it is a very good overview. Um, so definitely something to look up uh, if you would like to kind of read a little bit more about it. So, but we'll go through some of that here. Um, so birth outcomes in terms of health impact and air pollution. Um, so there's multiple studies, many systemic, systematic reviews and pulled analyses um, that are available that support associations between ambient air pollution exposure and adverse birth outcomes. And most of them have noticed effects on fetal growth, um, which is low birth weights or small for gestational age and preterm birth. And so they notice that um, it can uh, affect birth weights down to um, decreasing your birth weight from 10 to 30 grams, 30 grams being about an ounce, um, and also increase the odds of preterm birth. Um, and that's important because these, if you are low birth weight or small for age, that can affect your growth and development uh, in the future down the line, right? So um, it just leads to more and more health problems. Um, one of the studies actually um, had noticed that with uh, particulate matter, PM 2.5, 2.5 being the size, um, an increase in 10 micrograms was actually equivalent to smoking three to five cigarettes a day during pregnancy. And so it just points out, you know, we already know about all the you know, issues with cigarette smoking and most people would, you know, would recognize that you're not supposed to smoke during pregnancy. But the idea that, you know, just from the environment, you have um, the same kind of risk of at least, you know, uh, preterm birth is, is pretty shocking. Um, the other thing uh, to consider is the public health impact, as I mentioned, is significant. So in 2010, they noted in the U.S. that 3.3% of all preterm births um, were attributable to airborne uh, particulate matter exposure, and it cost the U.S. more than $5 billion in medical care and lost economic productivity. Um, so it's not to say that, you know, it's only about the money or anything, but certainly, you know, if you're trying to advocate for um, some sort of change in air pollution and exposure that is, you know, for some people financially, that is an, a motivation to try to start, you know, enacting some sort of change. Also, um, we mentioned fracking uh, before as a really big exposure and um, in Pennsylvania and exposure to fracking can uh, increase risk of congenital anomalies, preterm birth and small for gestational age as well. So certainly important to consider. So this is just a brief overview of the uh, birth outcomes. And so now we're going to focus on asthma, which is the, the main uh, issues here. So uh, kind of broke it down again into indoor and outdoor. Um, there's certainly a lot of different um, other air pollution sources that may also contribute to asthma. But I uh, focused on these four mainly because I have a little bit more um, uh, experience in talking about tobacco cessation strategies, um, especially down in uh, when I was in South Carolina, and then um, also recently for gas and wood burning stoves and advocacy, which I can talk a little bit about later. But um, so when it comes to indoor air pollutants, um, tobacco exposure certainly is a very uh, high uh, risk for um, asthma. And so uh, secondhand smoke exposure is associated with greater frequency of asthma symptoms, um, decreased response to uh, inhaled steroids, which is the treatments for an asthma exacerbation or asthma in general, uh, more severe asthma attacks, increased risk of asthma-related um, ED uh, emergency department visits and hospitalizations. Um, there was a study in Connecticut uh, recently that of 30,000 children with asthma at that found that the odds of being exposed to um, secondhand smoke exposure was twice as high in black and Latino children than in Caucasians. So this is certainly an area where, you know, if you're thinking about racial injustices and trying to, you know, target somewhere where you can try to help, this would be an, uh, an area that you could um, focus on. Uh, in terms of gas or wood burning stoves, um, 
they noticed that children living in a home um, have seen a 42 increased risk of uh, asthma and also an increased lifetime risk as well of developing asthma. And this was from a recent meta-analysis looking at nitrogen dioxide uh, and effects of nitrogen dioxide on asthma and wheezing in children. Um, they also noticed that if, you know, it's not just the, the fact that you have a gas cooking stove, but if you had poor ventilation, um, you would have issues with uh, lung function and asthma symptoms. And so um, they noticed that children who, um, never who reported never using exhaust fans had these issues versus those who um, did use exhaust fans actually did a little bit better. So uh, from an education standpoint, you know, talking about ventilation and making sure that that's um, something that is done at the home. When it comes to outdoor um, exposures, uh, Early, they've noted recently there's a lot of evidence developing supporting the role of early life exposures. So that means, you know, early childhood and also even, you know, in the womb. Um, and they noticed that asthma and allergies um, uh, can be affected and also reduce lung function because of air pollution. Um, so they've noticed, I think they were looking at nitric oxide and particulate matter and also potentially just traffic related air pollution. And they found increased risk of development and exacerbation of asthma. Um, and when it comes to outdoor air pollution, again, you can kind of break it down into urban and rural areas. Um, mainly in urban areas, it's more traffic related air pollution. It's often the most significant air exposure. I mean, air pollution exposure, and in rural areas, it may be more agricultural industries, that kind of thing. Um, and so, again, the main culprits are still uh, ozone, nitric oxide, and uh, particulate matter. And you can see that they do increase asthma symptoms, decrease lung function, and also increase doctor visits and school absences. So it can definitely affect learning as well. Not uh, may not be directly, but as a secondary effect because you you know you have to. Um, treat the asthma and go to your doctor and everything and see that. And it's interesting because I recently, you know, in the, over the last year, I've had a lot of uh, patients who've moved from New York, you know, downtown New York, Manhattan, Brooklyn, that kind of thing, both from, you know, from winter um, or even the summer. And they've noticed that their asthma has suddenly gotten better, you know, because they, you know, have moved from a very urban, dense, polluted area to, you know, Reading is a little less than compared to New York, right? And so it's interesting because you would think, you know, maybe it's just because of COVID or anything like that because during the lockdown in winter, but it was also I've had some patients who moved during the summer and noticed that. So you can think, it's just another thing to think that maybe it's related to, you know, air pollution, that kind of thing. Other thing um, when it comes to air pollution and asthma that I think is really important to mention is the environmental and climate justice aspects, right? We touched about it a little bit when talking about tobacco use, but specifically um, in for, for asthma and just general air pollution, um, Black and Hispanic people are exposed to more air pollution than they produce. And so this, this, there's this idea, you know, of the you know, racial advantage, uh, but now it's even down to climate advantage just because of where they live um, and, and, you know, what, based on where they um, live, they have this uh, disadvantage in this sense um, of living in areas where there's more pollution, even though they're not the ones who are um, polluting. Uh, a black child is eight times more likely to die from an asthma attack than a white child. Um, so black children experience 138,000 asthma attacks each year. So that are attributable to air pollutants. Um, and so they still die at a higher rate than white children with asthma. Um, so that's certainly, you know, really concerning. The, like we definitely need to do something about this. Um, compared with non-Hispanic white individuals, um, Asian American and Pacific Islander, black, non-Hispanic and Hispanic um, children are more likely to reside in areas that are unable to meet the air quality standards we had talked about earlier with the EPA, right? Um, and so that particularly for particulate matter and ozone, um, and that was uh, from an EPA study um, in when? Uh, recently. Uh, and so 
the idea is, you know, we talked about the Clean Air Act and the criteria pollutants, um, but the Clean Air Act only requ uh, requires pollution from an individual facility to be considered when issuing or renewing a facility permit. So it doesn't take into consideration cumulative impacts, um, right? So potentially, um, if you are in a county that's very highly industrialized, you know, there's one facility, they had to go through permitting, et cetera, and they were fine. But there's now, you know, that area is known for bringing in jobs for that certain thing. And so now there's you know, multiple facilities popping up, then you're, you're adding on pollution into the exact same communities in that area just starts getting more and more disadvantaged. And so that's something, you know, that is a, would be a target for, uh, you know, legislation or something like that to try and fix that problem. So it's not always the same communities over and over that are getting um, exposed and getting um, more of this climate disadvantage. So let me talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how children's health is impacted and, you know, what uh, um, different sources uh, and, you know, the environmental justice aspect as well. So now what can we do um, on different levels, right? So there's different levels of change. Um, on the individual level, you could always um, try to reduce your personal waste, right? So working on decreasing your use of plastic, um, also trying to, uh, you know, for instance, change uh, in terms of decreasing use of plastic, right? For instance, changing your, your laundry detergent from plastic to something that's more sustainable. Um, you know, like there's a, there's a lot of different environmentally friendly companies that are trying to do things like that. Um, like not endorsements, but uh, what I use is Blue Land. It's a, a environmentally friendly company that has a lot of different products like powder products. So when you buy things, it's less packaging, less plastic waste, that kind of thing. Um, or, and it's reusable or refillable, right? So it's not, you know, you have to buy a whole plastic jug every single time, right? If there's refillable options. So there's a lot of different, you know, lifestyle changes um, that you might be able to do at home um, to decrease, um, you know, plastic use and waste. Um, also, you know, try to moving to a try moving to a plant based or plant forward diet. Um, so that uh, can help with decreasing, you know, um, reliance on the meat industry and that kind of thing, since they are a very big uh, producer of, um, you know, greenhouse gases and all that as well. Um, and of course, that may not be for everybody, but certainly um, that also may be healthier for you on the nutrition side anyway, right, to be more plant-based. Um, also, you can on an individual level, you know, think about going electric as much as you can, right, or solar, that kind of thing, trying to think of sustainable options um, in terms of energy. And again, you know, financially, that may not be um, feasible for you or, you know, or to get an electric vehicle or anything like that. But they are certain things to think about or, you know, even over the next year, um, there are a lot of, if you're not ready to go fully electric, you know, plug in hybrid, um, hybrid options that can kind of help with uh, easing the transition to, to going fully electric and trying to decrease fossil fuels. Um, but sometimes, you know, people don't, it's hard to change your lifestyle, right? It's hard to do that. So, um, there are other ways that you can try to um, increase uh, your, to, to be um, involved, right? So on an organizational level, uh, depending on wherever you work, uh, there may be an opportunity to, you know, engage a sustainability officer or somebody who is um, in charge and has environmental friendly, you know, practices in mind, right? Um, or if there is not a person, can you be that person? Can you be like that point person to kind of look at um, how do we change the workplace to make it more green? Uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard of mygreendoctor.com, um, but it's a physician down in Florida who's put together this toolkit um, for people who want to try to green their office or their workspace. Um, and it, it goes through, you know, different uh, ways to decrease waste, um, paper waste, uh, you know, water consumption, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's, again, I'm not affiliated, not in, endorsing, <laughs> but uh, it's a good resource that we've been thinking, uh, been, um, I've looked into before. So the other thing is, you know, um, for policy wise, uh, 
you can, there's definitely a lot that you can do. <laughs> and so um, you can certainly contact legislators and let them know that, you know, climate is a priority. Um, if there's certain uh, issues that are out right now up for vote, you know, talk about those and make sure that they know that this is something that you're um, interested in and, and um, really want to make changes in. Um, you know, we had mentioned the um, impact, uh, the cumulative impact of air pollution and how uh, the Clean Air Act doesn't protect vulnerable communities. So there were some recent environmental justice uh, measures passed in New Jersey and Connecticut to try to limit the cumulative environmental and public health impacts um, of polluting industries on what they had called, quote, un overburdened communities. And so these can serve as models um, for similar legislation um, here. And uh, also you can, um, on the policy side, write op-eds or you know, letters to the editor to reach a broader audience and kind of you know, make it more aware that, hey, people are paying attention to this. This is important, you know, from a children's health standpoint, especially, you know, it's, it's a, and you know, adult health too, but I'm biased, <laughs> you know, to try to um, you know, make it more, of a common thing that people are talking about climate and climate change and it's not just um right or left or anything like that it's just everybody should be interested in this and this is why right um and also of course you can vote for climate initiatives that are up things like rggi or other things that are um being proposed and staying uh, aware of those issues and um of course, one way to stay aware is to join PSR <laughs> if you're not already um, to, you know, be involved with um, our activities and also um, our advocacy. Um, and one of those things as well from policy side um, is uh, uh, joining different groups. You know, if it's not PSR, it's in other, you know, there's certainly maybe other groups as well um, that may be more focused on certain things that you're interested in. All right. Um, so here are my references. Um, there, uh, there are a lot of, definitely a lot of references. So you can always reach out to me for more. I just picked these top three um, and I'm biased for the second one because I helped write that one. Uh, but um, the first one was the one I mentioned about the pediatrics um, and the policy statement that they had um, placed, uh, put out recently in June. Um, and then the second one is about air pollution and specifically about PM 2.5 and why that's important for children's health and their effects. Um, and the last one it just has a basic overview um, of uh, environmental contaminants uh, and that's the kind of thing for children's health for further reading if you're interested. All right, that's all I got. Is there any questions, any um, comments? Thank you, Stephanie. And so you can, or Steph, sorry, but you can see there's a lot of comments in the chat, but one question I had hopefully that I can share out to attendees now and those that weren't able to attend. You mentioned that there was um, some policy, policy change that happened in New Jersey and Connecticut. Would you mind sharing the link to that with me? And I'll share that back out to the folks that are on today. Uh, just because I think that would be interesting to see if there are folks who want to advocate in Pennsylvania. And I know there's people who are listening who are in other states as well. Yes, definitely. Um, that was, um, I have to go back and look through, but that was also listed in, I believe, the um, second reference that I had as well. The okay. links to that were in there. But I can send out the specific links as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a comment. Um, from Ned referencing air quality and how poor it is statewide. Um, local and state public health departments need to have a system in place to notify PA residents when poor air quality days are predicted. I was thinking that as well. <laughs> That's a big problem in yeah. Pittsburgh, trying to get the Allegheny Health Department to do so. I won't read the whole thing, but I actually thought about that while you were talking. Are there places where people can find air quality reports locally where they live? Yes, the EPA has um, the air quality like index um, searchable. And then there's also another one that's, um, sure, I forget the name, but I can look. 
in a second. I can send out the, the resource. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's another one that's crowdsourced um, that I know my fa family over in San Francisco that they use during the wildfires um, during that time. Um, but let's take a look at it. Purple purple air, I think it was. Oh, like right. That. that is a monitoring system. Yeah. And everyone stay tuned because PSRPA may be tapping into a network that everyone can use as well. More news on that <laughs> at the end of the year. We're still working on this project. And airnow.gov is another one that was mentioned. Uh, can you talk about wildfire smoke? It's not just burning wood, correct? That's a question. Yeah, so I mean, the 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 wildfire smoke, it's everything that comes from, it's essentially like combustion, right? So you have all the different particulate matters. And then um, also the fact that you're uh, destroying the, the trees that are supposed to be, you know, that can help with um, being a source of um, carbon dioxide reforest. Uh, uh, I also just had it from the air. Mm -hmm, go ahead. A quick question about what the percentage of carbon emissions from agriculture is, if you know off the top of your head, because we really don't mm. talk about that a lot. I see varying numbers, but that's kind of this unacknowledged contributor that right. we should probably pay a little bit more attention to. I, I think I had seen somewhere less than 10%, but I'm not sure. I have to, to look again. But I think the thing is um, you've, it may be a small proportion if you look nationwide, but then in the uh, areas that are rural that have agriculture emissions, you know, that's, it's very prominent in those areas. So you can't just ignore it. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's proportionally, it might be not as much contributing, but um, for those areas that are affected, it's very important. We also have a question about pollution from forest fires versus any inner city air pollution. Is there any record of which may be worse? Um, that I, I'm not sure, yeah, unfortunately. I would have to get back to you on that. That's a very okay. good question. <laughs> any other questions from anyone before we let Steph go? How do you counsel parents on protecting their asthmatic children from air pollution? Yeah, so definitely um, I do talk about air quality, um, the air quality index and trying to look that up. Um, and also um, pollen counts. I know that's not exactly you know, what we're talking about, but related to climate, right? Because definitely pollen can change with, uh, has been, you know, the seasons have been getting longer and getting worse um, and that can be affecting asthma as well. Um, but definitely looking at air quality index and um, pollution, uh, pollen and uh, just trying to be aware, right? As I mentioned, talking about um, the move from New York to here, right? So for people who have family who are in more urban areas or areas where I, I can imagine there's probably more um, pollution just based on, you know, traffic and car ex um, exposure. And they talk about making sure to take their rescue, make sure they have refills and that kind of thing, make sure they have their medications and try to help mitigate that. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, from a pediatrician standpoint, they don't always ask me about advocacy stuff, but I try to slide it in there because it's who I am. You know, so I always say, you know, and this could, you know, if you ever want to talk to your, you know, your legislator and things like that, you know, to talk about air pollution because that's affecting your asthma um, and just kind of giving that awareness because sometimes, you know, we're, no matter where you work as a health professional, you have a, a voice of um, expertise um, in some, in some manner. And so, um, being able to talk to whoever you work with uh, to try to just add a little bit more education, a little bit more awareness from wherever you are. And I think slowly that helps move the needle in the public perception that this is important. Thank you. I believe that's it for questions. So thank you everyone for attending. We'll be back next month, as I said, with Whisper Valley. Um, and in December, we have our half day conference. Uh, cradle to the grave, the reverberating health impacts of oil and gas industry, health hazards, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.